excited as I was last night, but I'm still excited, okay? <laughs> I'm glad to be here, and I hope you are too. Let's start with 457, 457, Lord be glorified, 457. Back to page 383, 383, satisfied. Now, the question, when I was here years ago, we sang the whole different version. So I don't know where we're at now, so I'm kind of lost. Are we singing the normal one? No, no, no we don't sing the normal one. We don't sing the normal one? Does she know it? Oh, she, know it. Uh, she can play everything. She better figure it out. All my life long I had panted for a drop from some cool spring. All right, we're going to have a one pinch hitter. Okay, again, I mean, I like that, the version we're going to do. I, I always have, and uh, like I say, it's been years ago, but I, I liked it then, and I like it now. <laughs>
back to page 517. 517, dwelling in Beulah Land. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> 517.
on Saturday night. It always amazes me how quickly revival uh, services go. And uh, so Saturday night. Glad that you've come. Some of you have been here every night. Thank you. Message somebody and say, well, I missed you in the revival. I'd love to see you tomorrow. And, well, I just haven't felt like going to church this week, they told me. I held my tongue, but I'll give it to them now. No. <laughs> I wanted to say, you know, sometimes we need church, and sometimes the church needs us. Can you imagine if our spiritual life is always what I can get out of church, what I feel like doing, when I want to go, when I want to hear the preacher preach, but to move to a, a place where, no, I'm, I'm going to support the kingdom of God. I'm going to, 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 to lift up the service and prayer and with my presence and uh, worship him. And uh, we need church and the church needs us. It takes both. And uh, so thank you. Thank you for those who've come. And uh, here we are on a Saturday, a Saturday night. <clears throat> Let's have a time of prayer. Pray for the services tomorrow, Sunday morning. Sunday morning is always, of course, your, your best crowd, probably. And uh, people here that, you know, won't be here all week. But Sunday mornings are also one of the harder times to get people to come to the altar and pray. And uh, so we're always hopeful that somebody will budge or move towards God on a Sunday morning. But being half asleep in the morning, it just doesn't seem to be <laughs> generally the the best time but let's pray pray God would be with us tomorrow in the services give us a good Sabbath day tomorrow any uh, spoken prayer requests tonight you'd like to make or mention I know there's lots of different needs that we've shared throughout the week God knows what those needs are but anything special tonight before we pray together okay let's stand let's stand for prayer Together tonight, let's bow our heads and uh, let's just seek him. Uh, Saturday night, God may have some, I know God has a plan for this service. He may have a special plan. Lord, here we are. We're just coming to you this evening, seeking your face. You, you, Lord, see every person that is here. You know where we are spiritually. You know all about us, Lord. The insides and the outsides, you see, Lord, where we've been yesterday you see where we are today, and you know the direction that we're headed. And Lord, we're praying tonight that you would, uh, you would help us, Lord, in a special way. That you would give us a special help to the preacher of the hour, Brother Whitaker. That you would anoint his lips, anoint his mind. That, Lord, he would preach with clarity the words of, of heaven. And that tonight, Lord, your servant would be used of you in a special way. Lord, we thank you for the, 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 the services we've had. We thank you, Lord, for the truth that we have heard. We thank you, Lord, that our faith has been strengthened. And, and Lord, we're in love with you and love living for you. Lord, bless the service tonight. Give the hearer, Lord, ear tonight, ears to hear. Give us ears to hear, Lord. Speak to the hearts of our young, of our children, Lord, right down to the youngest child, that they would be aware that there's a God in heaven that loves them, that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, that there is mercy and grace. Lord, speak to the youngest heart. We pray for the teenager and the young man, the young woman, Lord, uh, that, that needs to make a clear declaration of, of salvation, a clear declaration of the work that you've done within them. And so, Lord, speak to hearts, save the sinner, sanctify, keep and deliver, answer our prayer this evening. Lord, tomorrow as we go into the services, uh, Sunday morning, and Sunday night. Lord, we're asking you to come and settle down upon the Sunday morning service. You know everyone that's going to be here tomorrow. Lord, prepare the church. Prepare our hearts. Uh, oh, that it would be a place that we could meet with you. Lord, we pray that you would give victory on every hand. Lord, we'll give you thanks. We'll give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Anybody have a testimony tonight? Anybody have a testimony? Okay, good. to be a blessing and you found yourself blessed how about that that happens that happens in the journey happens in the way amen God's still working on you he is working on me through grace through mercy through blessings through trials amen anybody else want to testify tonight smallest crowd you don't have to be afraid you can be bold for the Lord tonight you can be as bold as Marshall Smart I'm going to have him tell you a story before he gets going tonight I, I want that Ramsey Camp story he's going to tell you a story Ramsey Camp was um, was was a camp that um, wow what's his name Templeton Preacher Wattrell, R.W. Wattrell, that was his camp meeting, Southern Indiana. So very conservative, very, very, um, no, probably no ball on the, on the campground, no, no play of any kind. Very, he has, a, he has an interesting story that I, I wanted to tell. He told us at breakfast this morning. And I don't know how spiritual the story is, but you'll enjoy it <laughs> as much as I do. Now his wife's probably like, oh no. <laughs> she's been dealing with this guy though for a lot of years so she can handle it <clears throat> any other testimonies we want to mind God we want to have an open clear atmosphere place that God can work we've enjoyed I've enjoyed the preaching this week enjoyed having the Whitakers with us enjoy his three point outlines a little bit of alliteration um Enjoyed that. Being bold in Babylon. I might steal that sermon from you. At least the outline of it. I won't, I'll, I'll preach it different than you. But uh, bold in Babylon. I, I've, I've enjoyed I've enjoyed having the Whitakers with us. And if you've enjoyed them, say amen. amen. Let's be a blessing to them. They've been a blessing to us. And we, we're, we're thankful. We're thankful. Amen. Okay, let's just find God tonight. Um, they're going to sing, I don't know, one, two songs, whatever they have. Okay, good, one song. And then uh, he's going to reg regale us with some Marshall Smart stories, and then he's going to preach. We'll leave the two separate. <laughs> well, let me, let me tell the Brother Smart story before I sing. Um, we were set at breakfast talking about Brother Smart, and Brother Smart was one of my heroes. And um, I remember he went to Ramsey Camp, Southern Indiana, and uh, if you ever knew Brother Smart, he would get on the side of the pulpit and jump and kick his legs out. And he'd look out the congregation. He'd say, you know why I do that and you don't? 
Because you're too fat to do it. And only Brother Smart could get by with that. But anyway, in the midst of his sermon on a, on a Ramsey camp night, as Brother Smart was preaching, he was jumping around, screaming and hollering and preaching. And whatever made him say it, but he said, there's not a person on this campground, but I could whoop. I could whip every one of you. He said, I could take every single one of you. And one of the fellas in the, in the congregation stood up. And he said, I beg to differ. I think I can get you. <laughs> Brother Smart said, well, let me finish preaching. And afterwards, we'll just meet right over here. And we'll find out who, who can do it the best. So Brother Smart preached. Altar was lined. People sought the Lord. Brother Smart draped his overcoat over his arm. And uh, met the fellow out, outside the tabernacle. There was a gravel uh, walkway there around the tabernacle. And he looked at the fella and called him by name. And he said, now you tell me how you want to do this. Make it as easy on you as you possibly can. You just tell me how you want to do it and we'll do it. They agreed on, on the rules of engagement in this fight. And within seconds... Of on your mark, get set, go. Within seconds, Brother Smart is a short fella. This guy's probably about six two, six three. Big fella, big robust fella. Brother Smart had him in the air and body slammed him right out there in the gra out there in the gravel. Brother Smart said, "Well, that was easy." He said, uh, "Sorry there, buddy." Have a good night. And got his coat and off he went to his motor home. And uh, it was quite uh, tense. In fact, uh, some of them uh, voted after that not to ever let him come back and preach because of that. And, uh, but just a few years later, Brother Smart happened to be in a camp meeting, in, a, in another camp meeting setting, not that one, of course. And this fellow shows up. And Brother Smart said, oh, no. Round number two. And so after the service, the fellow went up to Brother Smart and he said, uh, I want to see you in my trailer. Brother Smart said, okay, not a problem. I'll, I'll head that direction here in just a little bit. Well, Brother Smart went uh, out of the tabernacle, walked over to his uh, motor home, opened it up, reached up and grabbed his pistol, Stuck it in his front pocket. He said, I don't know what I'm about to get into. And he walked over to the man's trailer, knocked on the door. He heard the grouchy voice of the, of the individual inside. Come in. Brother Smart walked in. He said there was a lone candle burning on the table in that little trailer. And the man was sitting there twiddling a knife. And Brother Smart said, I thought, oh, my, it's going to be over with. He's going to kill me with that knife. And Brother Smart began to fumble with that pistol in his pocket, wondering what was going to happen, if he was going to have to use it or what was going to happen. Finally, Brother, the fellow said, Brother Smart, you remember what you did to me back a few years ago? Brother Smart said, yes, I do. And uh, they talked for just a little bit. The guy's grouchy and, and kind of upset sounding finally the guy smiled and he said brother smart i love you and he said here is a knife and this fella is is actually worldwide known for being a knife maker he said i love you and i i made this knife especially for you and handed it to him brother smart it made the face like only brother smart can and said hallelujah he took that knife hugged the old fella and out the door he went but that's the kind of preacher I grew up with. with. And so um, they, they were laughing at breakfast and t listened to my stories about Brother Smart. So they're... Oh, yeah. Brother Smart, there was a teenage boy in the church sitting in the back of the church making faces while Brother Smart preached. Brother Smart didn't put up with that. So Brother Smart looked at the fella in the back and he said, Sir, young fella, you're not going to act like that while Brother Smart's preaching. Get up out of your scene, come sit with your mom and dad. 
This wasn't a bus kid. This was church family kid. And he comes up and he sits with his mom and dad. And he's making faces and doing crazy things at, the, at, the, um, at his parents' seat. Brother Smart said, young man, you're not going to act like that. Well, I'm preaching. Get up out of your seat and come to the front pew. The boy got up, come to the front pew, sat down. Still didn't learn his lesson. So Brother Smart's preaching, and he's sticking his tongue out, making faces at Brother Smart. And I literally remember Brother Smart stepping out from behind the pulpit, taking his belt off. <laughs> and when he got down to the boy, he said, stand up and bend over. And Brother Smart, with his belt, I mean lit that boy up. I am lit him on fire, wore him out. The old boys are crying and uh, squalling and uh, grabbing his back end because it was on fire. Brother Smart spun him around, put his belt back on, grabbed him, kissed him on the forehead, said, Brother Smart loves you, but you're not going to act that way while I preach. Wham! Slammed him down in the front seat. That boy never acted up in church ever again. We're going to have to change gears. <laughs> but with a price, I'm not my own. I belong to Jesus.
praise the Lord. Well, as you're all surrendered to Jesus, do you belong to him? I trust you do this evening. If not, you can before the service is over with. You can belong to him. Praise the Lord. Before the service, a couple of individuals saying, we're trying to figure you out. They said, every other night you preach alliteration. I didn't know that. I preach what the Lord tells me to preach, and if it's alliteration, it is. And uh, so they were kind of thinking I was going to preach alliteration tonight, and I, I, I'm going to have to disappoint them. Um, you'll never get me figured out. My wife's lived with me almost 32 years, and she can't figure me out yet. Um, I do have a little bit of the HDD or, H, or ADD or ADHD or whatever that, those alphabet disease going on. I do have a little tinge of that. I do have a little tinge of dyslexic uh, problems going on. And sometimes when I read the scripture, I can't say and and the. Things get twisted up. I say numbers wrong. I do kind of goofy stuff. And I was telling someone that in a service, I was saying something of that sort. I had no idea. I had someone that had studied that kind of a problem with people in the congregation after the service was over, this fellow come up, and he said, I knew exactly that you were that. I said, how'd you, how'd you come up with that? He said, by your notes. I said, by my notes, you preach from yellow paper. I said, yellow paper, what does that have to do with it? He said, let me tell you something. People with dyslexic problems Yellow paper is comforting to them. I said, really? I mean, because I used to think, why would I want to do yellow paper? And I tried to buy the white, and I went back to yellow. And then they came out with this blue, and I thought, I'll do blue, and I just keep going back to yellow. And um, I, I type. I'm a, a secretary for the board of UBC, secretary for the ICHA. I type. Probably could type my messages if I could find some yellow paper to type it on. I had no idea that yellow was, was comforting. So if, if you wonder why I preach with yellow paper, I guess it's because it's comforting to me. And I didn't even know that. And I do know I had a fellow I was backing up and he said, turn to the left. And I had my hands on the steering wheel and he picked it up just quickly. He said, turn, turn your wheel to the left, and I went like this with my left hand on the steering wheel. I didn't know I did it, but I did that, and then I moved it. Later on, he said, turn to the right, and I did that on the steering wheel with my right hand, kind of like making sure I know where I am, what I'm doing. So if you see me doing stuff, you know, you know it's, it's just part of who I am. But uh, tonight I want to share with you maybe kind of an unusual um, style of a sermon, an unusual thought, but I believe there is something in here for every single one of us tonight. I believe to the church and to the Christian, there's something for you in this passage of Scripture. But if you are not saved tonight, and you don't know where you stand with the Lord, there's something in this message that, that should help you to realize that you can, you can find the Lord. You may have made a mess of life and a mess of your circumstances, but there is a God in heaven that's, that's ready to forgive. There's a God in heaven that wants to help you. And uh, so let's, let's look at the Word of God tonight. And uh, if you have your Bibles and would turn with me to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25 for our scripture reading this evening. Before we read, let's just bow our heads and ask God's blessing upon this, on his word as it is being read and then on the message as it is preached. Lord, we need your help tonight. We need the, the unctionizing power and presence of God in this, in this service tonight and touching this thy messenger from heaven above we pray, Lord, that you would bless the congregation tonight. May they have ears to hear and hearts that are open to receive what God wants to share with us this evening. 
from your word. I pray, Lord, that you would just make preaching easy and effective. And, Lord, we're, we're trusting in thee. We're asking thee that you would have your way and encourage our hearts and strengthen us in the good things of God. And for that, Lord, we'll not fail to give you all the praise. For it's in your name we pray these things. Amen. Exodus chapter 25 for our reading this evening, verse 1. And Moses spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold, silver, and brass, and blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine linen, and goat's hair, and ram skin dyed red, and badger skins, and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. If you study the, the Bible very long, you will soon realize as you begin to walk into the book of Exodus that you have walked into one of two books of redemption in the Old Testament. I'm glad we don't have to wait to the New Testament to read Matthew's account, Mark, Luke, and John to realize and to get a picture of redemption and to realize there's a God in heaven that wants to redeem. There are those who say you can't find Christ in the Old Testament. But my friend, the only way you can read the Old Testament and not find Christ is to read it with your eyes closed. The Old Testament is not necessarily about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, and Noah. Yes, they are heroes of the Old Testament. But from the book of Genesis, clear to the very last book of the, of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, the hero of the Word of God, the great theme of the Word of God, is the Lord. Jesus Christ. We see pictures of Christ in the Old Testament. We see him revealed in the New Testament. You say, preacher, if Exodus is one of those two books of redemption in the Old Testament, what is the other? The other is the book of Ruth. It is the other book of redemption. The book of Ruth is redemption by purchase. Ruth, that Moabite woman, comes on the scene in a dark day, as I've already mentioned. It was the day when the judges ruled, and every man did that which was right in their own eyes. That, my friend, is the kind of day that we're living in. On the other side of Ruth, we find First and Second Samuel. You, you go from judges having no king to First Samuel having man's king. Saul was man's king. Till you go to 2 Samuel and you get God's king. You get King David. But you go from the gloomy days of the judges and the gloomy days of, of Israel's history into the glory days of the story and the glory days of David's reign and David's kingship. And nestled in there is the story of Ruth, a picture of God's redemption, purchase redemption plan for mankind. Peter tells us that we're not redeemed with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, what a purchase and what a price he paid for us tonight. In Ruth chapter 4, she is, is standing at the gate. And the nearest of kinsmen, which was not Boaz, the nearest of kinsmen, and they are talking about the purchase of, of Ruth and Naomi's property. And when you purchase Naomi's property, you not only get Naomi, but you get Ruth. 
And the fellow that was the nearest to kinsman said, I'd rather not purchase that piece of property. I don't want to mar my name with this Moabite woman. I don't want to take a chance on smearing my name on this Moabite lady. But there was one standing next to next in line, and his name was Boaz. And he steps up, and he steps out, and he says, I will. I'll take a chance. I will return redeem that uh, Ruth and I'll redeem Naomi I'll buy the farm and redeem them and purchase the land Boaz is a picture of Christ who before the world was ever formed said that he would be the sent one I'll be the one I'll be that all sufficient sacrifice for sin he, he said, I'll pay the price for man's redemption. He laid his life down for you and for me. He didn't have to, but he loved us so much that he wanted to do it for us. Just like Ruth, she caught Boaz's eye. Somehow, some way, in our sin and in our wickedness, we caught the eye of the blessed Savior out there in sin. And the songwriter said, when, I, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. He loved me. He knew me in my sin. He knew me in my wickedness, yet he loved me. My friend, we are bought with a price we're not our own. We belong to Jesus. Hallelujah. At Calvary, my sin debt was paid and Mark paid in full. Hallelujah. People under, people begin to wonder about the worth of man, of something. The worth of, of what it, is, it involves, what involves the worth of something. One person said, the worth of something is what someone's willing to pay. You may say, well, my house is worth X number of thousands of dollars. It's only worth that if someone's going to buy it for that. But you th realize that the God of this universe, the God that spoke this world into existence, sent his only begotten son, the God of this universe was willing to pay the price for us and send his son to redeem us so that we wouldn't have to go to hell. I want to remind you on a Saturday night in this revival, you don't have to go to a devil's hell. God has paid the price, sent his son, to die on the old rugged cross to pay the price for you. He paid the price that we could not pay. He paid the price so that we could be the children of God. That blesses me tonight that he thought of his son worthy enough to be, to be sent, but he thought of us worthy enough to be brought into the family of God and to be children of the Most High God. Hallelujah. Thank God for the redemption by purchase. But as you walk into the book of Exodus, it's not long until you realize that the book of Exodus is also a book of redemption. It is not a book of redemption by purchase, but it is a book of redemption by power. The book of Exodus is a book of redemption by power. It is the Lord that brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. It is the Lord that delivered them from the hands of Pharaoh. It was the Lord that parted the Red Sea and they could cross over on dry land. It was the Lord that drowned the Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. It was the Lord that when they were out in the wilderness roaming around, needing something to eat, it was the Lord by power brought manna down from heaven and quelled down from heaven for those people to eat. It was the Lord when they were thirsty and, and their and their, and their uh, livestock needed water. It was the Lord that had Moses smite the rock and water came out of a dry and a dry old dusty rock and watered the place for them. The valleys uh, were filled up and the people began to rejoice because of who? Because of God and his power. It was the Lord that brought them across the Jordan River 
miraculously brought them across the Jordan River. It was the Lord and His power that brought down the walls of Jericho. And without having to do one single thing except obey the Lord and do what the Lord said, but no weapon of war was raised against Jericho and the walls came down. It is a book of redemption by power. Thank God we serve a powerful God. As you walk through the book of Exodus, you will soon come to chapter 20. Chapter 20 is a, is a powerful chapter. It is the first place that God wrote something down. And he wrote something down on the mount of God, Mount Sinai. Moses is up there visiting with the Lord. Moses is up there in the presence of the Lord. And God reaches down and takes two tablets of stone and with his own finger begins to write ten commandments. Not ten suggestions. Suggestions don't have any teeth to them but Ten Commandments. And you know what? Those Ten Commandments were not suggestions, but they were commandments. And through those Ten Commandments, God is trying to get His children, His people to understand these are Ten Commandments. And if you'll follow them, these are, this is a pattern for a holy living. Some people say, you can't, you can't be saved by doing the Ten Commandments. Well, you can't stay saved without doing them. They are for us. It's a pattern for holy living. And so God begins to deal with his people, with the nation of Israel, and begins to commune with them. But when you get to chapter 25, where our text is read from tonight, you'll find the very first offering ever taken. Now, I know you think that... Um, Van Warmer was the one that discovered offerings. And if you ever go, if you have ever been to the ICHA camp, you would think that Buddy Perry and Marcus Dodro discovered the offerings. I mean, boy, they get we we do hilarious offerings. I mean, it wouldn't work in the Allegheny camp. It just would. Jim Plank said, "Boys, that would never fly." in central Pennsylvania among the God's missionary people. But man, you guys do it up and you guys have fun doing it. Just go ahead and do it. And we do. I mean, whoever's up here saying we need $40,000 tonight, they'll send myself. and Brother Dodrell might be out there and we're walking around and uh, somebody will go like this. I say 500 and then someone will go, I'll say 100, and Brother Dodrell's doing it, and we're a hollering. And then they'll say, now, Barry, you're on this side. Brother Mark Dodrell on this side. And, buddy, we go out there, and we, we try to raise the money. But I know there are people over there on Brother Dodrell's side that are holding out because they want me to come over there just to give to me. And the same is on my side for Brother Dodrell. Well, man, we just have a big time. I mean, we, we, we raised over $140,000 in less than 10 minutes doing it that way. Brother, Brother Plank said, James Plank said, it had never flowed. It would never fly in central Pennsylvania. But you just go right ahead and do it. You have a good time doing it. But this offering, the first offering that we read about in the scriptures, you think offerings are wonderful. But then when you realize that the Lord tells them what to give. The Lord begins to tell them, this is what I want you to give. How many would love to be coming in on a Sunday morning and both Pastor Clyde's are at the door and said, bud, we're, we're expecting $100 from you today. Sister, we're expecting $500 from you. It better be in the plate. We're wanting two fifty from you. You look like you got money. We want a thousand from you. And it better be in the plate. I mean, would you? We wouldn't. We'd be like, man, we're going to find another place to worship. But God said, I want you to bring an offering, and this is what I want you to give me. 
begins to tell of the things that he wanted to give, wanted them to give. Gold. The reason why he said, I want you to give gold, because it speaks of deity. He said, I want you to give silver, for it speaks of the word of God. Psalm chapter 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure, are pure words, as silver tried in the furnaces of earth. Brass speaks of the judgments of God. Blue is a picture of the heavens. Purple, that of royalty. Scarlet, that of sacrifice and the shedding of blood. Fine linen is a picture of the priesthood in the Old Testament. And then we get the wood and we get all these things. But he goes on to say, he said, I want you to bring goat's hair. I want you to bring goat's hair as an offering to the house of the Lord. Now I can understand the wood. I can understand precious metals. I can understand all the other materials that, that the Lord said I want you to bring. But, he's, but when he said I want you to bring goat's hair. Now I don't know about you but I don't like goats. They're the nastiest dirty animals there ever was. I have, I have just a little uh, animosity in my heart towards goats. Because on a, on a Christian day school field trip at the Indianapolis Zoo, we were coming into the little petting area. And there was them billy goats running around there. And I was going to get some change with a dollar bill and put it in one of those machines and turn that thing around and get pebbles out to feed the goats and whatever else was in there. And while I'm standing in line holding my dollar, one of those goats... <laughs> Right out of my hand, ate my dollar. I grabbed that dude by the horns and I said, what in the world's wrong with you, you retard? Ate my, ate my dollar bill. I wanted to kick it. A buddy of mine had a Pepsi can that was empty. That crazy thing ate a dollar and then started going over there chewing on a Pepsi can. I thought you are the craziest one thing in all the world. I mean, I could see eating a dollar, but a Pepsi can? Crazy. And then if you turn your back on them, bam, they get you, you know, they buck you and carry on. I don't like goats. But God said, I want goat's hair in my tabernacle. And then you begin to read on that the walls of the tabernacle were going to be made with goat's hair. Any ladies have a, a wall in your home? Decor, you know, ladies love all that. You used to be home interior, home interior. I don't even know if it's in existence anymore. But I mean, boy, they have these swags and, and uh, candles and, and, and all this kind of stuff all over the walls, you know, in the house. But I, does anybody have a decoration of goat's hair in your, in your house? I didn't think so. Because we don't think of putting goat's hair on the wall. When I walk into this beautiful church, thank God for this lovely new church that you have. But I guarantee you in the planning of this church, I don't know who picked out the carpet and the pews and all that. But... If you ladies had anything to do with it, there wouldn't be a one of you that said, Brother Clyde, I think we ought to, I think we ought to have one wall in the church that's covered with goat's hair. There wouldn't be a person, there wouldn't be a lady on any committee that would say, I think we ought to have goat's hair on the wall. No. But God said, I want there to be goat's hair. I want my walls to be made of goat's hair. Now, let me go on to tell you the reason why there's, there's something significant about that goat's hair. In college, I wasn't the brightest student in all the world. I took that homiletic stuff where you learn those three-point outlines. Sometimes you'll find out that I don't have three points in this thing. I just got a bunch of stuff in this one. And, you know, they tell you a little about alliteration. I took that homiletic stuff. 
I also took another course called hermeneutics. Don't ask me to spell it. But I took hermeneutics and that's the studying of the word of God and the interpretation of the word of God. And there's something about hermeneutics that's quite interesting because when you, when you read something in the word of God, there is, there's a law in hermeneutics that says the law of the first mention. So you might be over there in 1 John chapter 1 verse whatever and you read something and you think, man, what, what was John saying here? You see the thought, you see the word. And the law of the first mention says, go back through Strong's Concordance or however, whatever method you can do, go back to where it's first mentioned in the Bible and then begin to follow it through the Bible till you get to 1 John chapter 1 verse whatever. And you're going to have a good idea of what God's trying to say. And so I thought, well, let's do that right here. But you know what? This is the first time goat's hair is mentioned in the Bible. So we're kind of stumped at what's this goat hair stuff all about. We're kind of stumped with that. It may be the first time it is mentioned, but I want you to know tonight it's not the first time we've seen it. If you go back to Genesis chapter 27, you'll read that Isaac is getting old. His eyesight is, is going from him. And Isaac is not long for this world. Isaac is going to soon die. And Isaac, as the father, is going to bless his son. So he tells Esau, Esau, I want you to go hunt some venison. And I want you to go out and kill a, a deer, kill, a ven kill some venison. I want you to bring it in. I want you to prepare it just like I like it. And I'm going to eat it and I'm going to bless you. Esau said, yes, sir. And out he went. Now, some of you may be better hunters than I am. But back in North Carolina and back in Indiana where I come from, I mean, you don't just walk in the woods in five minutes. You're shooting deer like crazy. It doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes you may hunt for several days before you get the right deer. And so Esau, we don't know how long Esau was gone, but Esau's out hunting for venison. And Rebekah hears what Isaac has said to Esau. And she said, hmm, Isaac's not my favorite. Jacob is my favorite. And I want Jacob to get the blessing. So she calls Jacob and she said, Jacob, your dad sent Esau out to kill some venison and bring it back and prepare it and, and feed him and he's going to bless him. We're going to do something while he's gone and you're going to get the blessing. So she said, go get me two kids. Now that's not these little kids in here. Aren't you glad when the Bible said kids, it wasn't Oliver and Everett. Is it Everett? Oliver and Everett, it wasn't them. I mean, there'd be some days probably the parent would, wouldn't mind. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've been there, you know, like, oh, yeah, let's sacrifice, you know. Just teasing. But, you know, there, she said, bring me two kids. That means two goats. And she killed those two goats. And she begins to make that savory meat just like Esau likes it. And they're about ready to go in with the big old platter for Isaac. And Jacob said, Mom, we forgot one thing. Esau is a hairy man. Esau's a hairy man and I'm fair skinned and, and, you know, I may have a little bit, but I don't have a whole lot. She said, no problem. She goes out. Having already skinned those goats, she takes the goat hair and she puts it on his fingers and his hand and up his arm. And she dressed him in such a way that when he goes in to Isaac, Isaac said, man, you don't sound like Esau. 
And he said, oh, Father, and I'm paraphrasing, but oh, Father, I have done as you've asked, and I've got the savory meat, and it's prepared, ready for you to eat. And he said, you don't sound like Esau. Oh, Dad, it's right here for you. Just go ahead and eat and bless me. He said, come here. Come a little closer. And he said, you don't sound like Esau, but you smell like him. Mom did a good job. He said, come just a little closer. And he reaches out and he begins to feel those fingers and that hand and up his arm. And he said, you don't sound like Esau, but you smell like him and you feel like him. And he said, give me the savory meat. And he eats that savory meat. And he reaches out and he blesses Jacob. And because of that goat's hair, on that day when Jacob comes in to Isaac, because of that goat's hair, you know what happened? Jacob comes in. He was the son that didn't belong. He was the son that it was not to be blessed. It was, I, it was Esau that was to be blessed. But he comes in in another man's name. He wasn't the one that belonged. But he comes in another man's name. He comes in another man's work. Here's my three points. You can kind of get. He comes in another man's name. He comes in another man's work. And he leaves with another man's blessing. That goat's hair got him the blessing. And so God said, I want you to put goat's hair on the tabernacle wall because I want those that come into this tabernacle to realize that it's only because of God. It's only because of Jesus Christ that you receive anything from the hand of God. That one that didn't belong was blessed. Can I tell you this evening, there was a day that I stepped in the old Salem Park Church at the age of 15. I didn't belong. I wasn't saved. I wasn't living for the Lord. I wasn't a part of the family of God. But I want you to know I stepped out of my seat and I came to an altar of prayer in another man's name, the name of Jesus. I knelt there and began to cry out to heaven, relying on another man's work, the work of Jesus Christ on Calvary. And I want you to know on this Saturday night, thank God in heaven, I walked out of that Salem Park Church that day with another man's blessing. I walked out of that church saved and blessed of God. Hallelujah. Because of that gold tear, we are the brother that didn't belong. You say, preacher, how do we know all this? Well, how many are into genealogies? How many love those books, I mean, those chapters when you get to them in your devotionals? I mean, don't that just bless the socks right off of you? I mean, wow, I'm in the, the, the genealogies. I mean, woo, I get up today and read the genealogies. I mean, you can about read them in your sleep because so-and-so begot so-and-so and he died and begot so-and-so and he begot. You know, you, you can about memorize, I mean, except the names. And if you've got my problem, you can't pronounce half those names. I mean, what in the world were they doing when they pronounced, when they gave some of them people the names? I mean, you had to be a rocket scientist to pronounce some of those things. But it was so-and-so begat so-and-so and he died and so-and-so begat so-and-so and he died and for chapters of that and then you get to Matthew's genealogy and you'll you'll read about a man that's found in those genealogies that never beguiled anyone up until that point in time that's Joseph I mean Joseph is in the in the line of Jesus He's mentioned there, and he didn't beget Jesus. He's in there. He didn't belong, but he's in there. I don't mean to be unkind to you women, but in Bible times, women weren't thought of very highly. 
it was the man. I mean, it was, it was I mean, boy, the, the women's lib would have trouble today in Bible times. You know, they would have thought, man, the Bible is a bunch of male chauvinists. Because, I mean, it was the man. But you realize there are five women mentioned in the genealogies of our Messiah, Jesus Christ? They, that's unheard of. They shouldn't be there. And of the five, there are three that are Gentiles. Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth. They're Gentiles. They shouldn't even be in there. But they're mentioned in Matthew's account. What is he saying? You don't belong because of one day a man came in with some goat hair. Repret come in in another man's name. Representing another man's work. And received another, another man's blessing. You belong tonight. The same way you walked out of that church that Sunday morning, that Sunday night, when God saved you. You didn't deserve a thing. But that goat hair on the wall of the tabernacle said you didn't belong, but I make you worthy. Just like that day you walked out of that revival service, a born-again Christian, out of that camp meeting service, a child of God, born again, your name written down in the Lamb's book of life, because of that goat's hair said, we didn't belong, we didn't deserve the blessing, but he was willing to give it to us anyway. Notice he didn't ask for goats. He asked for goat's hair. The only way to get goat's hair is to kill the goat. I mean, goats aren't like sheep. You can't shear goats, but you can shear sheep and get the wool. But to get the hair from a goat, you're going to have to kill it. And the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, gives us some important descriptions of those goats. You will find in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 5, you will see there were two goats for a sin offering. Verse 6, you're going to read the word atonement. Verse 7, you're going to read two goats. Verse 8, you're going to read two goats. In verse 8, you're going to read the word scapegoat. Verse 10, you're going to read the word scapegoat. Verse 11, you're going to read about atonement again. Verse 20, you're going to, you're going to read about rec being reconciled. Verse 21, you're going to read about transgressions. You say, why do you mean, preacher? What's all this represent? Well, let's apply this, what we have learned just this far. Let's learn from Leviticus chapter 16. That great chapter of the Day of Atonement, and a picture of Calvary in the future. The scripture would tell us that they would bring those two goats. One goat would be killed. The high priest would have that one goat killed. He would go in and he would sprinkle the altar. He would touch different places, the horn of the altar, with, that, with the blood of that goat. But after doing that, in verse 20 of chapter 16 of Leviticus, it says in verse 20, And when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. He's already dealt with the blood of the dead goat. And it says, And Aaron shall lay both hands... On the head of the live goat. And confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel. And all their transgressions in all their sins. Putting them upon the head of the goat. And shall send him away. Send the goat away. By 
the hand of a fit man, F-I-T, fit man, into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all the iniquities unto the land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat in that land that's not inhabited. Let it go in the wilderness. You say, what is he? What are you saying, preacher? Well, as that high priest Aaron would put his hands upon that scapegoat as symbolizing he is putting the sins of Israel upon that scapegoat. I want you to know there was a scapegoat from heaven one day that God put the sins of the whole world on. He was our scapegoat. We should have died, but he put the sins of the whole world upon that scapegoat. And then Aaron, after putting the sins upon the head of that scapegoat, he called the fit man. I want you to know that the fit man and the scapegoat are two in the same when it comes to the spiritual meaning of this. There's Jesus Christ is our scapegoat. He has the whole sin of the whole world placed upon him. But he's the only fit man that will lead that scapegoat out into the land not inhabited. And as he would lead, there would be guards and sentinels placed along the pathway as he makes the last crossing where the last guard, the last sentinel would be stationed. He would enter into the land not inhabited. He would be there for a little while, but it wasn't long until the fit men would come out of that wilderness, not having the scapegoat with him. And when he got to the first guard or the first sentinel, the guard would raise the flag and begin to wave the flag. And he'd go to the next one and he would raise the flag and to the next one and he would raise the flag. And I want you to know the closer he got to the high priest, more flags were raised and more flags were waving. And when he got up towards the tabernacle where the high priest was, there was pandemonium, there was shouting, there was rejoicing because when he got to the high priest the high priest Aaron would step out and say your sins are forgiven your sins are gone you say why all the rejoicing preacher why all the excitement well the songwriter put it this way you ask me why I'm happy well I'll just tell you why because my sin is gone hallelujah and I want you to know the scripture says that our fit man, he, t- he put that old scapegoat out into the wilderness and he took our sins and removed our sin as far as the east is from the west. Hallelujah. And he placed them in the depths of the sea never to be remembered against us anymore. I want, I want you to know when, you, when the devil tries to come to you and tell you of your dirty, rotten, low-down, good-for-nothing past, the, the, the course in heaven is being sung, what sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. From the book of life, they've all bl- been blotted out. I don't remember them anymore. That's why there's rejoicing. And that high priest would say, your sins are gone. It was for a year, and then they'd redo it over again every year. But I want you to know, this very evening on a Saturday night, there was one that we're getting ready to celebrate next week. There is one that came and died on the old rugged cross, and he didn't die because of the nail-pierced hands. He didn't die from the crown of thorns. He didn't die from all the beating and the, and the mockery and the ridicule. He didn't die because the spear was thrust into his side, but he died because of the weight of the whole sin of the whole world was placed upon him. He took our place. He's our scapegoat. And I bless his name. I praise him tonight. The reason for the goat hair, it tells us our burden of sin is gone. Our sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. 
placed in the depths of the sea, never to be remembered against us. You know, there's only one place in the scripture where the fit man is mentioned, and that's this one. And I want you to know there's only one man that's fit, and that's Jesus Christ. You know, there's only one place in the Bible where Calvary is mentioned, and that is Luke chapter 23, verse 33, because there only needs to be one Calvary. There only needed to be one place called Calvary where the Son of God would die on an old rugged cross for your sins and mine. Christ, that very Son of God, is our fit man. Hallelujah. He's our scapegoat. Hallelujah. And tonight, because of the goat's hair, as you entered into that tabernacle, you said... That reminds me that I didn't belong. But I came in another man's name. Came in another man's work. And thank God I'm leaving today with another man's blessing. I wonder tonight on this Saturday night as we close, as we stand tonight, if you don't know that you're saved tonight, that goat's hair says, you don't belong, but I'm going to make you worthy. That goat's hair says, you don't belong, but you can come in the name of my son. You can come in the work that he performed on Calvary, and you can come and be blessed and leave this service saved with every sin covered by the blood because of Jesus Christ. I want my wife to slip to the piano, and I want her to play Jesus Paid It All. All to him I owe. And if you have a need tonight, why don't you just step out? Don't wait till tomorrow morning. Don't wait till tomorrow night. Don't wait till the next Sunday. Don't wait till the next revival. Do business with the Lord tonight. You're not worthy, neither was I. But I want you to know he will make us worthy. Praise the Lord. Let's, what page is that? 218 let's sing it this evening and if you have a, a need in your heart would you just step out and mind the Lord I I want us to close our eyes and bow our heads. This won't save you, my friend. 
But if you're here tonight and you have a spiritual need, and you would just like to raise your hand and signify, preacher, I have a need. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to come back to you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to tell Pastor Clyde who you are. But if you have a need, you say, preacher, I don't know that I'm saved. I don't know where I am spiritually, but I want it. I want what Jesus paid to have, for me to have. Would you just slip up your hand? Anyone? Thank God for this hand. Is there another? Anyone else? There's another. Anyone else? Say, preacher, I, I want to I want to serve God. I want to live for him. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to come to you. But on this last verse, those of you that raised your hand, why don't you just step out and be the man that you ought to be, the woman that you ought to be, and come and meet me down here at this altar. And let me have a closing word of prayer with you. Because God can meet your need. You can't do it. You can't do it. You've tried and made a mess of it. But God is able to help you and give you victory. Let's sing that fourth verse one more time. one more time and if you are contemplating should I step out why don't you just do it it'll be the best thing you've ever done it'll be the best thing you've ever in all your life has done I believe God's wanting to meet someone's need tonight if you'd just mind him I want her to play it one more time and this will be the end of the course Step out. Mind the Lord. Let him have his way with you. Praise the Lord. Thank God. Brother Dan Clyde, would you dismiss us in prayer this evening? Faith to see souls saved. Oh, yeah. Give us faith to see you glorified.